Hello guys, Walt Alon here and welcome to Deck Lab, the series where we test and showcase the latest in deck building innovation. Today we're taking a look at Dark Galaxy, a deck that got a good amount of support from the Zuijo Strongest Battle Deck and also one new card from the yet to be released set for t symbol of the World Winds. The goal of the deck is to control the opponents and grind the games out and eventually you're going to be winning through attrition through your piercing spells. Let's go over the card by card. Firstly, the Void Velga Requiem. Uh, the main thing about this card is that it gets bigger than 25 very easily. By itself, it gets up to 28 on your turn. And with additional setup like having other dogs on your board or having an opponent's monster be light, you can get up to 4,000 uh, with its own effect. The anti-light effect isn't something we want to build around because it's just an additional 600. And sometimes that does help you win the game, but it's not something that you should base the entire deck around. So, uh, I don't... I feel like you need to build, uh, have like attribute changing type effects in your deck for this. Uh, the main thing about it is that it just hits over 25 and that's all that matters and even if you are caring about the light, at the anti-light part of the effect, there are already a couple good light monsters in the format already that are quite relevant like the Galactic Oblivion for Secret Order variants, Dragius for X Order or just Dragon variants, uh, Mirror Innovator and Aegis Breaker in Light Machine variants and so on. There's already a couple good light attribute monsters in the format, obviously less than uh, in the past but still a fair amount so I think Raphael will still be able to get relatively fair amount of attack most of the time and again the important part is that it, it hits over 25, that's all that matters. Second boss monster in the deck is the Void Velga Elysium which we are playing 3 copies of as well. Uh, this also hits over 25 but does need to discard one for it but it does come with some additional extra advantages, firstly this Flips a face up monster and puts you to face down. This dodges things like battle motion, cross target, and things that uh, traps that, like trigger when you attack into their face up monster of like a specific type, like those. This can get around those. And flipping something face down also means that you'll be able to attack into them with a like, weaker monster. Generally, high level monsters have high attack and lower defense, and sometimes those lower defense stats allow them to be hit over by your other lower level monsters. There are a lot of 1500 defenders, like Dragus has 1500 defense. And even like the lesser used ones like 7 Throat Magician has, 20, has 1500 cross promotion that is in play in decks that run Secret Order. It has zero defense and so you can use at least to set it face down and then use a low level to attack over those. Something like a Pale Rider can even get over the 1500 defense that Dragius has for example. It also can protect itself from destruction from trap effects if you're discarding a monster which you will generally be doing. Uh, this helps you dodge even more types of traps like Hard Defense Mission, Dark Revelation, Mirror Force and just stuff that destroys stuff. Uh, Elysium can dodge a lot of things which is why we are playing it in this deck and also in general it is just something that hits over 25 which I personally find very good. We are playing one copy of Ultra Violady. this has a continuous effect that neither player can special summon level 7 monsters from the graveyard. This is a floodgate effect that doesn't affect us but it does affect uh, Thunderbolt, Gate Order decks that rely on special summoning level 7 from the graveyard to achieve their game plan. Uh, this does put a damper on those matchups uh, very well. You can consider running even more copies of this but the reason why I'm not is because the if you're not playing a matchup where the floodgate effect matters it is a 2500 vanilla and that's not particularly useful so we only play one copy of it. Uh, but if you do want to play more of it you can cut one Elysium one directly in my opinion I think that it's a fine ratio to be at if you want to max out on this. We're also playing two copies of Star Transfer. This is one of your main ways to have a sort of inevitability. It sends itself on the field to the graveyard to special summon a galaxy from your hand to the field face up. Then if you special summon a level 8, it gains 400 attack and inflicts piercing battle damage. So you'll use that piercing battle damage to hopefully uh, give the finishing blow to your opponent. Uh, the problem is you do need the level 8 in hand as well as the Star Trek so you didn't hand already developed from the board. So you're, uh, it isn't as repeatable as you'd like, you do have to continuously dodge Star Transfer plus level 8 uh, over and over again to be able to have that uh, kill pressure. And sometimes because you don't draw that 2 card combo, sometimes you just start going uh, swing 3 times past turn and you just don't really accomplish that much. Uh, so there are better ways to deal piercing dam damage but Star Transfer is still a Dark Galaxy monster and that has a couple synergies with other cards in the deck. Uh, also, the 400 attack bonus helps things like Violady and Elysium beat over other 25s uh, without using Elysium's effect, for example, and Violady can't hit over 25 on its own. So, Star Transit is good in those situations. We're also playing 3 copies of Void Velga Globule. This treats itself as 2 tributes for a tribute summon of a Dark Galaxy type monster, which is all of our 2 tribute monsters in this deck. This helps us cheat out our monsters, and that is something that this deck kind of struggles with, so having the Globule is a must, in my opinion. 
Also playing three copies in the Perishon Colony for a similar reason, this is harder to make use of because you need to already have a high level galaxy on your board. But it does a similar thing to Globio in that it's basically two tributes, it summons another Perishon Colony to the field from your graveyard, uh, which basically treating itself as two tributes at that point. But it does need more board space, it does need you to already have developed the uh, bottom of on the field already, need to have another high level in your hand, and it's just like overall less flexible compared to Globio, but it is still kind of like Globio's number 4 through 6 basically. We're playing 3 copies of Void Belga Pale Rider and 3 copies of uh, Void Belga Hoplite, these are practically the same card, but Pale Rider 1600 attack does matter uh, for cases where you set a Dragon's Face down with a Elysium and Pale Rider is the only low level thing I hit over that in that situation. Uh, I'm choosing the high attack ones because they work really well Void Bell will go over that later on. In general, the more aggressive beat sticks is pretty good for this deck in my opinion, especially paired with the Elysium. Three copies of Sea Dragon Knight, this helps us check back row alongside the other back row mover in the deck, and can also recycle our strong uh, pieces like other level 8, our strong utility that galaxies copies of itself, or the three copies of the Barrier Statue of the Inferno, which we are playing here. This slows down the metagame Thunderbolt. That's not the kindly this, they do have outs to it, but they do need to have the out, so if you don't have the out, they're gonna have to spend the turn just doing it into it and passing back to you. Gate order doesn't take kindly to it as well. Uh, people are playing cross mode motion because of it, and also even some builds are playing Volcano Attack Dragon, which is wild, right? This uh, really uh, puts a damper on those kinds of uh, special summoning strategies, even like maximums of fusions, even. As for spell cards, we are playing two copies of Universe Storm and three copies of the Ghost Cyclone. This is inspired from the second place. Galaxy Cup Dragon list that was on 6 back row removal spells and 2 copies of Sea Dragon Knight. We have increased 1 copy of Sea Dragon Knight and uh, reduced 1 of the back row removal spells by 1, and that being the Universe Storm uh, uh, as an analog to the Dragon's Inferno in the second place list. We are playing 3 copies of Ghost Cyclone as opposed to 2 copies because Ghost Cyclone is a spell that you want to find as early as possible because it draws you an additional card if you have 3 or less monsters in the graveyard and that happens early game. Uh, Universe Storm still is pretty good though, it uh, is more synergistic with the Sea Dry Knight since you can normal summon the Sea Dry Knight, check the back row, and then use your Universe Storm as opposed to using Ghost Cyclone first and then checking whatever you didn't put with the Sea Dry Knight. Uh, Universe Storm also is good uh, just in general, generally when you're in a position where, you're, where you've already committed to your board, you already have an established board state, but you still want to get rid of back row, Universe Storm can do that for you. One copy of the Void Corridor, this helps you fetch any Dark Galaxy from your graveyard to your hand at the cost of discarding one card. This lets you retrieve your level 8 if you want to, you can also retrieve a low level if you're desperate like a Globio or something to get some tribute forward to the board. It can also help uh, fetch the Star Transfer, which is why we're still playing it. Uh, basically a way to fetch Piercing from your graveyard. Uh, speaking of Piercing, uh, one, uh, two copies of the Void Velga Tear is in this deck. Very similar card to Star Transfer in that it gives 400 attack and Piercing. But the difference is it is a equip spell, which matters a lot. Firstly, uh, being a spell card means that you can bank it for future turns by setting it into your spell trap zone. Secondly, being uh, an equip spell, it, its effects are continuous. That means that the 400 attack bonus persists for your opponent's turn as well, meaning that your 2500 beat stakes are harder to beat over. And the piercing battle damage part of the effect carries over to your future turns as well, which means that you have multiple turns of that piercing, which gives you more of that inevitability and more consistent ways to win the game. One copy of Monster Reborn as our legend card. There are a couple things you can play here. I think Mirror Force is viable as well. I'm choosing Monster Reborn because it is better into Thunderbolt as a proactive legend card. And in niche cases, you can also revive their level 7 or just revive things that your opponent might want in graveyard. Uh, sometimes that messes them up, and if you're in a position that you can do that, uh, do assess if you want to do that or not. Definitely matchup dependent when you do that. But generally, this is just here to revive a level 8 because. Uh, generally, this deck doesn't have a good way of developing monsters onto the board, and Monster Reborn does help with that. As for trap cards, two copies of the Crisis and the Sacred Tower that everyone knows about, we're not gonna discuss this any further, it's just really good, to especially Thunderbolt. And two copies of the Void of Veil, this is uh, honestly the main reason to play Dark Galaxy, it is very similar to Crisis in that it stops summoning, uh, but the difference is instead of just normal summons, it also stops special summons, and has the option to bounce uh, defense position monsters on your, on your opponent's board back to their hand as long as you control a level 8 galaxy as well. Uh, that's matchup dependent, sometimes you don't want to bounce their high level back to their hand. Like let's say you're playing against Thunderbolt, you don't want to risk them being able to do the uh, whole loop again. Uh, if you're playing against like maybe more niche matchups like uh, like 
heavy metal variants that are running heavy metal and you don't want them to be able to re-trigger it or like Boring Kong for example. They're just some things that you don't want them to be able to re-trigger again and Void Veil has the option to uh, not let them reuse it or uh, to bounce it away from the board state uh, depending on what you want. Uh, it definitely requires some reading of the matchup and some awareness of the board state to use effectively. As for other cards you can run here, the Transy is okay but it's only really good in the gate order and gate order isn't particularly popular nowadays. Hackathon Care is the stickiest high level Dark Galaxy that you can run, the problem is it is not a level 8 and it doesn't do anything on its own, it is only good in combination with other cards which is why we're not on it. Burst Ray Gunman is a way of changing your opponent's monsters to light attribute if you want that and also the uh, direct damage part of it can occasionally help you close out games faster. Though the problem with this is that the loss of 300 attack uh, from playing this over something like a Hoplite makes it so that uh, there are some things that you uh, could otherwise be over but you can't because you played Gunman over Hoplite. Something like Galactica Jamaivu, something like a Globule in the mirror match even, or Dodoro Second in uh, some baseball variants. Uh, there's just some things that Burst Ray Gunman can be over which is why I'm playing Hoplite just to be safe. Miginagi is also a pretty good card, it lets you retrieve a level 8 from your graveyard. We're only playing several level 8s but that didn't stop Dragon Caster from doing that in the past, especially since they were only on three targets back then. And you also only have uh, you also have other 1,000 attack and defense monsters that are already playing in the deck anyway, like the Barrow Statue and the Parachute Colony. So Mikinagi is a fine option to run. The only problem is it is not a Dark Galaxy monster, which means that you can't shuffle it back with Globio. You can't uh, use it for the Void Veil. It's uh, a bit awkward to work around. And I think it's also even better alongside something like the Trade-In to discard your level 8s and fetch back with the Mignanagi. Definitely a different build that I can consider, we are undoing that here, but definitely still something that you shouldn't sleep on. And the reason why we're not on Trade-In over some of these other spells is because instead of consistency, I favored the utility more, as I believe the deck does need that uh, bump to its ceiling to be able to do more things, and I don't think the consistency is going to cut it here, especially since we're only on 7 level 8s in the entire deck. And uh, there's also a lot of other tribes you can run, a Catacaster, Trapple, Traplet, Insane Crisis, there's a lot of different things you can uh, experiment with, as opposed to these four here, just uh, good things to just mess around with in my opinion. Uh, that's all for the decklist, now let's take a look at some gameplay. This game is against Machine, a rather interesting variant running Sakuretsu Armor and Track Tiger. We'll see how that goes for them, I suppose. They will start the turn drawing a Bicon, which they will attribute uh, over for the Giant Tank Rex. You will draw for turn a Perishing Poly, not particularly useful. Let's see if you can find something over this Gold Cyclone, popping the Sakuretsu in force. Nothing here, we'll just set everything and pass the turn. We're setting the three Dark Galaxies here as in case we draw into the third Globule, and if they wipe the board, we can use Globules Effective. Uh, that's uh, unlikely to happen, but uh, just in case it happens, it will be good to do this play. They'll use Craft Drone to discard the Amy Go to draw a card and using the, the st start hatchback as tribute photo for the mirror innovator then using mirror no innovator's effect to shuffle a card gaining piercing then they'll use the pierce spell to give joy and ranks piercing and then attack over two of our monsters and pass back to us we will draw for turn still nothing uh, this is the problem with running low amounts of high levels you do have to risk doing this but interesting that ratio felt good so we're still sticking with that ratio we'll just set everything and pass the turn they will draw two iron onslaughts to be able to clear both wall back rows, lucky them. Uh, definitely very unfortunate for us, they will use the mirror innovator again to shuffle the bicon back to the deck to gain piercing, attacking over the barrier statue. Then they will use the joint direct to attack global and pass back to us. We will draw for turn finally a high level, we will uh, normal summon the Elysium to discard the Sea Dragon Knight to flip the Joint Rex to defense position. We'll normal summon the Pale Rider, set the Reborn, use the Pale Rider to attack into the defense position Joint Rex, then using the beefed up Elysium to attack over their Mirror Innovator and pass back to them. They'll normal summon the Crafter Drone, discarding a 4 cock to draw a card into another Crafter Drone to draw another card. Then they'll normal summon the, the Track Tiger, which doesn't do anything here because it uh, doesn't get bigger than 25. We're not even going to use the effect to get piercing back or anything, they'll just attack over the Pale Rider and pass back to us. We will draw for turn another high level monster, which is pretty good. We'll use the transfer to summon the Requiem from our hand, use its effect to gain attack, use the Elysium to set the Track Tiger, and then use Tear Thing on the Elysium to get two bodies with piercing to deal a huge chunk of damage to them. They will draw for turn a. Oh no, that could actually be lethal, they'll use the 
Uh, Shiva 7 treasures with this card, the Joint Direct, and draw two cards. They will use the slot hatchback, and if they hit this, they do have a lethal line with the Mirror Innovator. They do hit it, but they debuff the wrong monster, which means that it won't die just yet. They'll use the Mirror Innovator to just uh, shuffle three level 7s back into the deck to attack over the Elysium and uh, dealing a large amount of damage, but not lethal because they didn't debuff the correct monster. They'll pass back to us, with, uh, where we will draw the Universe Storm to destroy one of their back row. Using the monster, we want to summon the Trancer, uh, using the Trancer's effect to special summon the Fire Lady from our hand. Then using the Requiem to gain attack, using first the uh, Fire Lady to attack into a face down monster, this place around battle emotion. And uh, this place around battle emotion, uh, in that even if he doesn't die, he won't have the life points to activate it if he does have it, which uh, we, he doesn't have it. But if he did have it, that'd be a pretty good way to play around it. We'll use the Requiem to attack into their life points for lethal. Second game here, we have the Ghost Cyclone in rotation again and the Star Trancer. We're just needing to find a high level here and we have a pretty strong turn. They will start the turn drawing another card. You use the Ritual Performer here to draw another card because they hit the Ghost Cyclone off the top. Normal something a 4 card tribute thing over it for the Mirror Innovator. Setting two cards in normal summoning outsold our model and passing back to us. We draw another barrier statue, not particularly useful here, but we'll see what this ghost cyclone has in store for us. We'll destroy the iron onslaught and drawing a card. They'll use the power shock here, which is a pretty interesting tech card here, buffing the mirror innovator to 34. Unfortunately for them, we never had the opportunity to gain enough attack to beat over the innovator anyway, so we'll just normal summon the transfer set everything else. Attack over the assault our model and pass back to them. Effectively, they've wasted the power shock, but to be fair, that was still the correct play uh, from their point of view. They'll draw over turn a Magical Stone Excavation which they will use to add the Iron Onslaught to destroy one of the back row Paranoid much. They'll uh, hit the Gripping here and they'll use the Mirror Innovator to gain some attack. And then they'll normal summon the Assault Armado, set the Sakuretsu Force, attack over both of our monsters and pass back to us. We will draw for turn a Ghost Cyclone again. Uh, turns out it is in fact live. We do have exactly three low level monsters in our graveyard, which means the Ghost Cyclone will be drawing a card here. A low level is exactly what we needed. We'll normal summon the Violet, set the rest of our cards, and attack over the Mirror Evator, passing back to them. We have the Crisis at Sacred Tower here at our disposal to stop any shenanigans. Unless they have something like an Aim Eagle, we should be pretty safe here. They will find an Amigo, but they don't have the high level to special summon off of it. They'll pass back to us, then they will use the Universe Storm twice here to destroy both of their back row, destroying a Sakurata Force and the armor, which is pretty interesting. We'll use the Tear Thing, then normal summon two Hoplites, going to battle, swinging over all of their monsters, and dealing, dealing some piercing battle damage along the way. They will draw for turn, uh, not a particularly good hand here. They will normal summon the Track Tiger. We will respond with the Void Veil, I'm thinking here. Uh, because the Track Tiger isn't a light attribute monster, even if they had another copy of Bicon, it's going to be actually pretty difficult for them to get the attribute folder online to actually do anything here. They'd have to have drawn two uh, monsters exactly here. And even if they did have the two monsters, we had a Crisis at a Sacred Tower to uh, pierce over their set Track Tiger anyway. So we choose to bounce the Track Tiger with the Void Veil. In response to that, they will concede. This match is against Fusion Dragon, not a deck that you normally see, but Still one of the decks of the game nonetheless. They will be going first here, they will draw a, another sports dragon and set everything and pass back to us. We will draw for turn a pale rider, we'll just noble summon both the hoplites and the pale rider that we just drew, set everything else, swing over the two monsters and pass back to them. Just to get back and forth here, nothing much to say here. They do find an amazing dealer here which they will use to discard three cards and draw three cards between the reborn in the hand. They draw another phoenix dragon so not punished here, they will noble summon the Sports Dragon Slugger use the Dragon's Inferno to destroy our Universe Storm, a good trade of our backroom rules here. They'll use the Phoenix Shrine to discard another copy of the Slugger to add the Mirrorgears to the hand, they'll tribute summon the Mirrorgears, and then they'll go to battle using the Mirrorgears to attack over the Pale Rider, and then they'll use they'll try to use the Slugger to attack our face down, but it is the Globio, so they will be taking 300 damage as a result. Passing back to us, we draw a pretty good hand here. Transo will be able to special summon the Elysium from hand here, then using the Elysium to set the Mirrorgears face down, then normal summoning Hoplite setting the Void Veil and attacking them uh, with our monsters. We'll use the Hoplites to attack the Slugger first to play around uh, Dragon's Fortitude. If we had attacked the Mirrorgears first, we would have given them a level 7 to shuffle back with the Fortitude if they wanted to, which would have blocked off this Hoplite Swing, so we'll do that first. Then we'll use the Elysium to attack into their face down Mirrorgears, then the Hoplites directly, and then we'll pass back to them. 
we have a Void Veil and a Turfing, so they are prob they are effectively dead. They do have to reborn though, so let's see what they can do. They'll use the Slugger to summon the Pitcher, uh, they'll use the Pitcher to summon the Slugger rather. Then we'll use the Monster Reborn to summon the Phoenix Dragon, using the Phoenix Dragon to discard the Dragon and add another copy of Mirrorgears back to the head. Then they will Tribute Summon the Mirrorgears and then use its effect to debuff our two Hoplites. Then they'll use Mountain. I didn't use Void Veil here because the Mirrorgears wasn't able to hit over the Elysium anyway, but they did have the Mountain, so we got punished, I suppose. But statistically, it was pretty likely for them not to have anything there, and they will just do the 5k and then pass back to us. But since they have the Mountain, they are able to beat over both one of our Hoplites and the Elysium and pass back to us. We will draw for turn a uh, Requiem, which is really good here. We can use the Glorio to shovel three of our Dark Galaxies back to count as two tributes for this Requiem that is in our hand, which we will do so right now. Then we will normal summon the other Hoplites, use the Requiem effect for a uh, big damage boost. Then we we'll use the Tearfing on the one of the Hoplites here because we won't be uh, using the Requiem to attack the Phoenix Dragon because we need it to attack the Mirrorgears. So we're using the Tearfing to give the Piercing to one of our other monsters to pierce over the Phoenix Dragon. Setting the Crisis, we'll go to battle using the uh, Requiem to attack over the Mirrorgears. They do have the uh, Dragon's Fortitude, which we were playing around earlier. They will shuffle the Mirrorgears back to Crash, and then the Hoplites with Piercing attacks over the Phoenix Dragon, and the other Hoplites attack directly, leaving them at 800. They will draw for turn if another Phoenix Dragon was really strong here. They do make a misplay here. They saw that we have two Dark Galaxies on board and didn't consider Void Veil existing, so they're just gonna go Phoenix Dragon here. Uh, to which we will use the Void Veil immediately. My uh, thought here is. Uh, Phoenix Dragon is one way that they can get to their uh, tribute monsters, and if they don't have another one, that means we can use the Hoplite to attack over the Phoenix Dragon and win the game through Piercing. Or we can attack over the Fortitude Dragon to do a big chunk of damage that way. Just anything over 1900 will kill all the Piercing from the Hoplites as well. And if they had another monster to tribute someone, we also have the Crisis and the Secret Tower to contest that. So we are, we were overall extremely fine using the Void Veil here to just not give them any chances. They do have the Torero here, which they could have used to shut off the Void Veil, but instead they chose not to do that yet. But they will use the Torero here to remove uh, the tier thing and set our Hoplites face down to attack into, not before setting uh, the fusion and passing back to us after attacking into the Hoplites. We will draw for turn uh, two Elysiums, which is not bad here. We'll use the Globio to uh, tribute summon this Elysium for only one uh, monster. We'll use the Elysium to discard the other Elysium to set the Terrell into defense, and then we'll use this to attack over the Fortitude Dragon. If he hadn't done that, this would have uh, he would have lived an extra turn because of the Fortitude because he would decrease our monster's attack by 700, which would leave him at exactly 100. But because he used the Elysium to set the Torero, we got the additional 500, which means we could play through the Dragon's Fortitude that he has, which he will desperately try to activate here. Game 2 of this match here, they actually side decked uh, a couple cards into this matchup, but I didn't because I was extremely lazy. So uh, let's see how that goes for me. They will start the turn with an amazing dealer here. They'll use the Amazing Dealer to discard everything except the Hard Offense mission and drawing 3 cards. Then they'll set the 2 monsters, uh, activate mountains, set the Hard Offense mission and pass back to us. We will draw for turn a Sea Dragonite, which is actually pretty good here. We'll use the Requiem and Mill 1. Then, uh, unfortunately, we mill the Void Veil here, but uh, oh well, just what can you do, right? Uh, we'll use the Sea Dragonite to check in the background and we find the Hard Offense mission. Uh, now, I was thinking of just running into it now, but I felt like because of the sheer number of back removal that I had, I had a pretty good chance of finding some way to get rid of it and uh, that that line of play would re not require me to just run head first into the Heart of S mission. So instead of doing uh, attacking with the Requiem, we attack with the Sea Dragonite into the Amazing Dealer and use the Barrier Statue to attack into one of the uh, set monsters. It was the Dragon, they already have another one so uh, it didn't matter which one I chose and we will pass back to them. They will draw for turn uh, a very poor hand here, they will set everything and pass back to us. They do have a Dragon's Fortitude as well, so that's important to note. We'll Tribute Summon the uh, Elysium mostly to free up space for the other Sea Dragon Knight. And rotation here, we'll use the Requiem to try to melt another monster. Unfortunately, we don't find anything, but we can use the Sea Dragon Knight to shuffle the Barrier Statue and the Sea Dragon Knight to check another back row. And it turns out to be the Fusion. And then we'll set one and attack with our monsters. We'll attack with the Elysium first, just to see if they want to actually activate it. They choose not to activate the Heart Offense mission here. Uh, thinking that they, we might end up attacking with the Requiem. So we'll, after we attack, we'll pass back to them. They'll draw a Mirror Gears, which doesn't do that much here, but they do have the Fortitude Dragon to mill a card. They mill the Hard Offense mission, which means that the Sea Dragonite is able to check the Hard Offense and destroy it later on. 
Uh, they will trigger some of the Mirrors as well and setting another card, uh, attacking over our monster and passing back to them. Passing back to us rather, we'll draw our cards, we'll use the uh, Void Vulgar Elysium to discard the Seizure Knight. I probably would have discarded the Parashroom Colony instead, but live and learn I suppose. We we'll, uh, use Elysium to set the Mirrors face down. We'll use the Siege Dry Knight to check the hard offense to destroy it, normal summon the Pale Rider, and then attack into their monsters, dealing a total of 500 damage. This, well, no, not 500 damage, because I forgot to play around uh, Giant Fortitude this time for some reason, so instead of dealing 500 damage, I will be taking 200 damage and losing the Pale Rider, passing back to them. They will draw for turn, nothing particularly good though. They, will, they are able to reset the Dragon's Fortitude with the Fortitude Dragon and are able to destroy our Ghost Cyclone with the Dragon's Inferno and they will pass back to us. We will draw for turn a Universe Storm which is pretty good. He will mill a card, I uh, will discard a card with the Elysium to get monsters into the grave. Then we will use the Sea Dragon to shuffle them back to check back row. We hit a Heart of Mission which we will destroy. We use the Universe Storm here to destroy the Dragon's Fortitude instead of Fusion. Uh, uh, they technically could do the fusion play, except for the fact that they already lost all three of the dragons. If they have star restart, then popping the fusion would mean they just add it back to the hand. So we destroy the trap that would have been a nuisance later on. We'll normal summon the Eurequium, activate the effect Miller card, then we'll normal summon the Parachroom Colony and just attack into their three monsters and pass it back to them. They will draw for turn a Phoenix Dragon plus Mirrors, which would be good if our deck was a level 7 deck, but unfortunately it isn't. It isn't. Uh, they will use the Phoenix Dragon to add back the Metagears, they will use the uh, 42 Dragon to reset the Dragon's 42 milling a card. They will use the Mirror Gears uh, to gain the double attack and attack overall two high levels with the Mirror Gears, attacking over... Choosing not to... Why did he not attack you? I don't... Y you know, uh, sometimes your opponents make some plays that you can't explain, you know? just. Sometimes they make some incredibly odd plays. Uh, we got, I guess they were trying to play around Ghost Cyclone. I, I guess I lost one already. I, and I wasn't getting the draw for that. I don't think that was particularly worth it. And I already know what your back row is. Regardless, we will tribute summon the Elysium. I use the Elysium to discard the Ghost Cyclone to set the Metagears. Then we we'll use the Parachute Colony to get an additional monster onto the board. Uh, instead of attacking the, the Mirror Gears here, we attack into the Phoenix Dragon. Uh, we could have chosen to attack the Fortitude Dragon so that they couldn't reset it anyway. But I just went over the Phoenix Dragon because uh, that would allow them to add another high level back to their hand. And I want to make sure that I cut them off of high levels instead of uh, getting rid of just this recursion loop that doesn't... Uh, that is impactful but not impactful enough for me to care about it. Uh, no reason to attack the Mirror Gears here because they could just add it back to the Phoenix Dragon. So we just attack into the Phoenix Dragon for more damage basically. We'll do the 16 and pass back to them. Uh, they will draw for turn a okay hand here. They will a be able to reset the Dragon's Fortitude after milling with the Fortitude Dragon. They will normal summon the Mirror Gears and normal summon the Metagears over the Mirror Gears for some reason. I cannot explain that either. And uh, after doing that, we will Void Veil them just in case they have Slurry start to make a fusion here. We'll do that and instead of adding it back to your hand, we are setting it just in case that they can tribute summon it. Or they can tribute summon something else and then discard uh, the Meta Gears for something like the Mirror Gears or even the Zero Gears if they were playing it, which turns out they aren't. They'll normal summon the uh, Mirror Gears here and attack over the Elysium and pass back to us. We'll draw a monster we want, which is really good here. We'll special summon the Elysium, activate the effect, discarding a card, setting the Mirror Gears, and then we'll activate Tear Thing to gain the piercing battle damage. We'll attack into the set Mirror Gears to which they will respond with a Dragon's Fortitude, reducing damage ideal, and we will pass back to them after doing that. They'll activate Monster Reborn here, which is pretty good. They'll normal summon the Mirror Gears, we'll activate the Dragon Inferno to destroy our equip spell, then they will use Mirror Gears to discard the Meta Gears, and attacking into our Elysium and one of the Parachute Colonies and passing back to them. We will draw for turn a siege, uh, good hand here, honestly. We'll use Siege Dragonite to check the Dragon's Fortitude. We already knew this was fusion, so we didn't need to check this one again. So we checked the only unknown back row, which was another Dragon's Fortitude, which we could destroy. That means that they are completely wide open right now. We use the Star Transfer, activate the effect to special summon the Elysium. Use Elysium, discarding the Barrier Statue to set the Mirror Gears. Normal summoning, and I, I discard the Hobble. I guess it doesn't matter here. It is the same amount of damage, anyways, which will attack into everything and, and win the game. This match is against a win access psychic beatdown list. I thought that it was Thunderbolt in the first turn, but as uh, the later turns will show and the hand in front of you, it is not that uh, kind of deck. 
uh, they will go first, join and see all those they will set alongside the Wicked Shadow Dark logo. We will draw for turn Tribute Follow for the Void Walker Requiem, which we will use to gain 300 attack. Then you to see join and check the back where we find a Secret Order. And I figure that Secret Order is a big threat uh, since that gives them a lot of tempo onto the board. So we choose to Universe Storm them in case they find the handy of the top. Uh, we use the Requiem to attack the set monster, which was the logo, we kill it, and we use Seedry Knight to attack directly and pass back to them. They will draw for turn another secret order. You know, sometimes that happens, and also the Handy Lady go with it. You know, sometimes you are just very skilled. You find the Handy Lady, you set the uh, Candy and the Cross Target, attack over the Void Barrel Requiem, and pass back. Uh, we will draw a Transo, which we'll, they will use to use... Mm. We will use to summon the... Requiem here using the effect to gain attack, using a Siege Dragonite to check the back row. We find the cross target here, then we'll set the rest of our cards. Go to battle, we'll use the Siege Dragonite to check the back row. Uh, if uh, for some reason they wanted to use the cross target on that, they could. Uh, they choose not to for obvious reasons, so we choose to not attack to hopefully find other pieces of back row to get rid of the cross target later on and not to lose too much tempo on board. Uh, they will draw for turn, uh, not a particularly useful hand, they'll use the jump set to get rid of our Requiem, set two cards, attack over the Sea Dry Knight, pass back to us. And we will draw for turn, a pretty good hand, we'll uh, tribute summon the Requiem, normal summon Globio, use Requiem's effect to gain attack, use Globio's effect to shuffle some Dark Galaxies back to tribute summon the uh, Ultra Fire Lady for one less tribute, set the Ghost Cyclone, go to battle, will attack the Handy Lady with the Fire Lady to force the Cross Target to be activated now which they will do so, bouncing the Violet to hand and also adding the Romance pick as well. Now we attack the set monster because we don't want to uh, make their life points low enough for them to activate the Romance pick. And they also have a card reprint as well to give themselves more life points and extra draw here. Uh, their hand here is not good. Uh, if I had given them the life points that they needed to activate Romance Pick, this hand would be a lot better, but because I didn't, and because they gained additional life points and killed the Jemai Wu, they are gonna have to do some legwork to make this hand work here. They'll draw for turn another 2 tribute, not what you want to see. They'll normal summon the Bandijo, but we will use the Crisis and the Secret Tower on it to prevent its uh, effects from being good here. They'll normal summon the Prophecy Phrase using the track to discard all of our cards here, dealing some burn damage and debuffing the Requiem just enough for the Prophecy Phrase to attack over it, passing back to us. We will draw for turn a very good hand here. This is the problem with some of these psychic monsters. They just have very low defense. Uh, Prophecy phrase when Dijo have like zero defense and the new Aspot that isn't an Eater Pro on uh, at the time of recording also has zero defense. So something like Elysium is really good into, into this matchup. We use the Globule to cheat out this Elysium by shuffling three Dark Galaxies into our deck. Then we will use the Elysium's effect to discard the Perishroom Colony to set the Prophecy Phrase to its zero defense position, activating the Void Velga Tear Thing to give it piercing and 400 attacks, and in the Crisis, going to battle, dealing 3400 damage to them and passing back. They will draw for turn a Romance Pick, which is really good, and also the Upstar King Rex with its life here because we have zero cards in hand. They will use the Romance Pick to activate and mill no Psychics, they mill zero Psychics, so they whiff the effect. And they are forced to just normal summon the Bandijo, which we will use the Crisis at the Secret Tower on. To which they will concede, even though it is not directly lethal yet, but the writing was on the wall. Game 2 here, they will be going first and they managed to find the Amazing Dealer alongside a Romance Pick, so this will be an interesting turn from them. They will use the Amazing Dealer discarding 3 cards to draw 3 cards, using the Amazing uh, Romance Pick to mill 3 cards and add the progress portal back to their hand, tributing uh, the bandijo and uh, normal summoning the progress portal, sending the rest of the cards and pass back to them, passing back to us. We will draw an Elysium, which is perfect here, we'll uh, tri tribute summon the transfer, activating the effect to special summon the, the Elysium from hand. We choose to use this effect here to discard the Sea Dragon Knight to set the bandijo, this is to play around cross targets since we knew that they were on it last game. Uh, we will normal summon the Barrier Statue as well to prevent Secret Order. Then we will use the Elysium with the Piercing Effect to attack over the Bandijo uh, using the Barrier Statue to attack into the set monster, hoping to see uh, some monster be destroyed here. And we find a Eye Bear Can, which technically didn't do anything, but it was true before that anyway. They will draw for turn a good hand here, honestly. They will use Upstart King Rex to draw a card to see what they can get. They will tribute summon the Ken Speedy alongside the Psychic Monster to activate Ken Speedy's effect to 200 attack. They'll use the Progress Bottle to shuffle our Parachute Colony back into the deck and draw a card. They found a Bandijo, which is pretty good here, but they don't have the uh, level 2 or lower second normal to add back, so they're just gonna 
have it be a 2500 vanilla. They'll use, uh, there are two monsters to attack over our two monsters and pass it back to us. We will draw for turn, uh, unfortunately no tribute monsters, but uh, that's what you get for running only seven of them. We'll just set everything and pass back to them and just stall for a bit. Uh, they'll find a Wicked Shadow Dark Lurker, which is incredible in this position, which they will probably use, and that will bait out the Crisis Tether Sacred Tower here. They'll use the Secret Order to summon Handy E from hand, then set two cards, go to battle, destroy two of our monsters, pass back to us. This is nice up of our Guild Cyclone, which is extremely unfortunate here. We'll draw for turn, we found the Elysium here, we can start to do some plays. We'll use Sea Dry Knight to check the back row, it is a jam set, which is very unfortunate. We'll use the Universe Storm to destroy one of their back rows to find the, the cross target. We chose not to hit the gem set because I wanted to make sure I can kill their monsters, but it, uh, the gem set does uh, stop my Void Veil from being live, which is definitely not ideal as well. We'll use the Elysium to discard the Void Veil to continue playing around cross target. We'll set the Handy Lady because if they have another cross target, they can use the secondary part of the effect to add back another psychic kill. We'll flip summon the Parachute Colony for some reason, even though we know that they have the gem set and they can easily use it to remove the Void Veil. This, honestly, I was playing quite late at, and, uh, you know, sometimes to make this place, you know. We'll use the Elysium attack over the Lurker because we didn't want the Void Veil to uh, be destroyed here, passing back to them. And here, uh, they use the Port of Arrows that they drew up the top to shuffle some cards back and draw two cards here. Uh, using Romance Pick, which we will immediately use the Void Veil on. Uh, they should have just jammed. Did they have the candy? I think they did. Yeah, they had candy already. They could have. They should have used it immediately to uh, remove the Void Veil from the equation here. For some reason, they didn't do that. Uh, we choose to bounce the handy, the handy lady back to hand. Uh, I was thinking they already had other two tributes in hand, so bouncing a handy lady back meant that. Uh, they wouldn't, they would have to work harder to make a board. Unfortunately, the Handy Lady bounce was the wrong decision here as they do have to share with Sentra to discard it to draw two cards, which finds another Bandijo which can add back the candy and gain a, a bunch of attack. Then they can free up that space for the Romance page, which we will find another Bandijo using that effect to add another candy and then using the Secret Order and this is uh, way over lethal with the multiple 4000 attack beat sticks and my uh, comparatively frail board. Game 3 here, I have a pretty interesting hand, uh, but realistically all we're going to do is just going to tribute summon one of these guys and pass back to them afterwards. We will set to tribute summon the Elysium first. Arachium is a lower investment card on the crackback here, so I chose to keep it in hand first. And we'll normal summon the Barrow Statue to play around the Secret Order if they do have it. They don't have it, turns out, and they will just set their whole hand and pass back to us. We will draw for turn. A fine hand here, we'll normal summon a pair rider, set everything and uh, go to battle and attack over everything. Uh, we choose we chose to not tribute summon the Requiem here just to be able to clear all of their monsters here. And we didn't necessarily need to tribute summon the Requiem yet. We don't have a high count of high levels in hand, so conserving some of them is fine. Here to make sure we have high levels on turns that we actually need them. Passing back to them, they will draw a secret order here, which is completely dead because of the, the barrier statue. Unfortunately, they do have the Jam set to get rid of it though, so uh, their secret order is now live again, which they will use immediately to summon the handy lady from hand. Setting two cards and taking over the Elysium, passing back to us. Uh, this is why I regret not uh, saving the Elysium in hand because uh, it will be able to play around the cross target. Unfortunately, we uh, fortunately for us, we all we drew another copy anyway, so uh, never punish right. We find the cross target and of the uh, Siege Dragon Knight, then we we'll use the Universe Storm to destroy something else because we know that we will be playing around the cross target this turn anyway. So we find a card reprint uh, of the Universe Storm, then we will tribute summon the uh, Star Trancer using its effect to summon the Elysium from hand using Elysium's effect to discard the Requiem, setting the Handy Lady turning off the cross target, going to battle and attacking over their monster sent directly. Uh, the, we kept the Pale Rider before the Void Bill to be live, which will come in very useful this turn. They will uh, use Amazing Dealer's effect to discard 3 cards and draw 3 cards. Uh, they find an absolutely horrendous hand here. They will tribute summon the Bandijo to which we will respond with the Void Bill. And because they have, their back row is cross target, cross target, and we uh, end up choosing to bounce it back to their hand here, uh, because we have lethal on board, they will just concede. Now that we're back to the deck, let's go over what I think of it. So the deck definitely feels, uh, to me, it definitely feels fun to play. I do enjoy uh, running specifically the Void Veil, it's just a 
incredibly interesting card, uh, very disruptive to opposing players. Just overall, very strong card and definitely the reason to play this deck in my opinion. Uh, this deck, uh, the problem with this deck is slow. Uh, you've seen in the games where like I don't draw high levels in time, I don't draw the traps in time. It's just like twiddling their thumbs until they manage to find the, the, there's some plays to do and uh, that definitely gets outpaced by some of the faster decks in the format like Thunderbolt for example uh, especially if you don't manage to find your disruptive plays like your Void Veil, your Barrier Statue, your Violet and whatnot uh, but when it does get the ball rolling it is definitely very oppressive Void, again Void Veil is incredibly powerful uh, Crisis while not in theme is still incredibly strong generic tool and Barrier Statue Violet are incredibly strong as well and the uh, five pieces of background will really put in work. So you did see like those Cyclone didn't really do that much in some situations when your opponent is just accidentally playing around it, just not killing your last monster and then you can't really use it. Uh, but when you do draw it early, it is very strong and it really gives you that huge tempo lead, which is in my opinion one of this deck's weakness. This deck doesn't really have a strong way of developing guys onto the board and again can get outpaced by the faster decks in the format. Uh, you do you do have the capability of playing around a lot of things. I did mention this in the intro. I believe a Star Trancer can play around Crisis at a Secret Tower. The Elysium can play around a lot of trap cards. Wily the Barrier Statue plays around all the special summoning tools that are popular in the format. And Sea Dragon Knight Plus 5 back row plays around everything else in the back row. Just overall like very good package of cards in my opinion. Another thing about this deck is that it is quite fair. Like, there aren't that many unfair tools that you can use to just auto win. I guess you could theoretically count Void Veil and the stun tools, but you're not always in a matchup where the stun tools are good, right? Like, uh, obviously there are matchups where Barrier Statue doesn't actually stop your opponent from doing anything, while he uh, is in the same boat as well. And outside of that, you don't really have uh, that many auto wins outside of the stun tools. Void Veil, again, is the closest thing you can consider to it, but you still need some risk assessment to use it properly. Like whether you want to bounce the Thunderbolt or not or you want to just risk it and make their board empty for you to attack over I feel like there, there's not like any you, uh, in my opinion you need to work to win your games which isn't necessarily bad in my opinion definitely feels satisfying to win uh, more so due to player skill than uh, abusing it in a, a interaction over and over again like playing Thunderbolt and Thunderbolt is a different uh, type of fun to me in my opinion but uh, Dark Galaxy hits a spot of like making you think, making you assess the situation, just like making you play with good fundamentals, uh, understanding the matchups and that is why I really like this deck. Uh, but again, uh, problems with this deck, it's slow, it doesn't have the tempo that other decks has but the pros of the deck, it's very disruptive and uh, skill testing in my opinion. That will be it for this deck lab, thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.